Thank you. Well, so cheers. Yes. Friends, welcome. Cheers to a beautiful Saturday night. Close. Close. We have an Austrian visitor. It's so exciting to have someone from Europe. Thanks for having me. Well, we've been living together now for a few months, so the excitement is a little worn off. Oh, I'm sorry. But good to see you guys again. I'm only kidding. Every day is an adventure. <laughs> Well, it was a gorgeous day. Um, we had very different experiences, I think, the three of us relative to Plant Delights. Mm -hmm. um, mine was primarily indoors, teaching botanical illustration. And then my day, uh, because I work in the garden and not the nursery, um, consists basically of standing around and letting people tell me what a good job I've done, which is <laughs> lovely, uh, because I've only been there a short time, you know. Um, but it never hurts to hear. And yeah, it's just eight hours of people arriving, feeling the energy of the garden, letting out a deep breath and saying, I'm finally here. I really am going to be here for hours and I'm going to be hollering every time I need a, a question answered. And most of the time, I know if I see one or two persons bent over with their fannies in the air, those are my kind of people because they're looking very closely at the plants, which means they are inspecting minute details. And you don't find that kind of clientele in any other nursery. I worked for Lowe's for six years, all told, and I would give to these customers my passion and just spend time with them, and they would walk away without buying one single plant. So. It really is refreshing when we have these open house events because we live what we call under the dome, but the day-to-day -day is, um, you know, just us as a family, um, a group of friends who all are there because the plants are awesome. And then on open house days, we get to welcome the public without appointment and they just flock in from multiple states, multiple countries, some open house events. You know? And what a diverse crowd. Mm -hmm. But you know, I don't know if you guys feel the way, but when I was working at Plant Delights, the open house was um, uh, kind of a performance on my behalf as well, because otherwise my work at Plant Delights uh, was really rather quiet. Very solitary. Very peaceful, mm -hmm. solitary, but then suddenly you're the tour guide on this amazing plant tour. Well, we so let me interrupt you, but what well, did you do at Plant Delights? Plant Delights was, no my, <laughs> was my very first job in horticulture. Oh my God. And I arrived in Raleigh having discovered um, gardening. Um, I was uh, working as kind of an installation artist in Greensboro at the time. I had turned 27. I discovered this new craft. See, 27 is the age to go there. Awesome. <laughs> I think that's like the transition age. I think by 27, you kind of fill around with your undergraduate degree and like whatever that first career choice is long enough to be like, uh, I don't think you make great decisions at 18 necessarily. And by 27, you've had enough. And it's time to be an adult and then kind of take on that next whatever that next era is. And um, and by the way, it was 10 years ago, two months ago, that you, myself, and Aaron Weston uh, became friends. Well, we met wild? during an op a spring open house. Oh, that's right. Yeah. He was the weekend waterer. And so oh, no. we would never right. interact with Preston. And for months, <laughs> we would never. <laughs> Talking about the family. Yes. You work during the week. I work during the week. Weekend. And we Not would, because of Preston. We would hear character. about this Preston character, and we were all very curious <laughs> as to who he was. Oh, well, well. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> But, you know, that was a wonderful job for an introvert because, I mean, you know, I had just turned 27. I had just returned to school. Um, everyone that I was in school with was easily five years younger. And mm -hmm. so that first couple of semesters, it was, I hit it pretty hard on Friday and Saturday nights. And so that job was an excellent opportunity for me to be like, be quiet. 
and um, just walk around and absorb all of these new plants that I had never, well, plants and processes, because otherwise I had just been fiddling around in the backyard and discovered this world. And plant delights from the get-go, just like, that, the world just like uh, opened oh, wide. Yeah. I do remember like, oh, you know, I tell people that some of the stupidest objects in the planet are hoses <laughs> because they don't do anything you want them to. They are just like the laziest spouse. Oh, you, know? yes. just, you walk around, they don't follow very well, they grab things. Yeah. Um, you get a wet. <laughs> I hope that Tony remembers my tenure there uh, fondly. I do remember one conversation we had together um, where I had um, failed to water uh, the epimediums again, and I realized that if I don't care for it, I didn't water it. Oh, right. well, well, you know, I just, I don't understand epimedium. I don't get it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> hey, we need some I, <laughs> I hope you're an epimedium fan on this I, side of the I table. I am. Yeah, okay. And so, like, epimediums to me are what the hostas could just go away to oh, a degree. No, and no. epimediums <laughs> could be replacing Wait. them, at least for the southern gardens. Yeah. I don't mean everywhere, but epimediums for, for our climate are far more responsible ecologically. But you have to walk around with a little <laughs> <laughs> Not all of them. You know, Daryl Probst introduced some that are um, three-foot petioles and, you know, are just magnificent specimens. And no. they do so well in dry shade with acidic That's true. They're pHs. And very useful. So do hostas. They just don't <laughs> go fast enough for me. It's just not rewarding. I just feel like it's kind of one of those things. It's like a parrot. You will it to your grandkids. And <laughs> <laughs> maybe 30 years of investment, you've got an extra... It's just not my style. But I do Maybe love... you have to talk to them a little bit more. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> talk about the very dark side. Side. Yeah. They get the feeling that you don't respect them, and, I'm not and that's just they don't and they're them. just. Oh, wait. It's the wiry stems. I'm not into it. I like a good fleshy plant. So the hosta, I'm totally down. I'm totally um, down. Too. Um, My absolute favorite. Well, and I like hosta in a, a slightly colder climate where they can really store enough carbohydrates to be able to grow with vigor, which okay. our climate doesn't really afford right. that. I, I totally like, get that because yeah. I've seen so many around here. I'm like, I they're know just so in small. my garden they're like huge and here they're like sort of... In Michigan, they're like tiny. foundation shrubs in the summer. They're oh, just yeah. amazing, but we don't have the right climate to grow hostas in their best condition. I fell in love with hosta, not from from walking up on hosta, but from looking at it from below. I discovered hosta from a third story apartment and had a, uh, a person who lived on the first floor with a fabulous hosta garden. This was in Charlottesville, Virginia. And uh, I think there you can get away with some... You oh, they're, they're a zone and a half older. Uh, six. Yeah. Six. Yeah. So, Easy. yeah. Uh, no Skyline Drive, but you know, um, I fell in love with hosta from above, and I feel like people rarely uh, garden from above, or really appreciate hosta from above, but if you think about hosta from the side view, it's really kind of rather remarkable, or unremarkable rather, it's kind of like, um, from above, you get the full extent of the plant, you get the full extent of the patterns, all that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, there's a lot of texture. Yeah, yeah, colors, absolutely. Yeah. So when I spec hosta, I very rarely put them at a distance. I pull them really, really close. And I put them at the base of a deck or a seating area where you can kind of look down and really kind of feel how lush and tropical and the different layers of the short ones to the medium ones and the tall ones. Da, 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 da. Um, but uh, yeah, guarding from different perspectives has uh, been a, a oh, challenge yes. to, you know, in a place, this place, Raleigh doesn't have a lot of topography change. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so you're telling the girl from the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, you must feel like you're at the beach or, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, so we've talked about how we found plantalites, but you found plantalites in a wholly different yeah. way. Oh yeah, but actually it's funny because hosta was one of the first things that draw my attention to plantalites. Because oh. I met David and Kerry Hoffman in Germany and they told me all about this place called plantalites and I should come hang out there. And the very first thing I read about plant delights was actually that Tony's really big in hosta breeding. So I was really interested in that. And because they told me it's great, and my dad told me that there is this guy, Tony Avent, I should go work for. <laughs> and your dad is? My dad is Christian Kress from Sarastro Nursery in Austria. And 
you know, the business is sort of very small still, like people know each other. So he knew about Tony Avent and it took me until the day when I sent my application to Plant the Lights and Tony Avent to realize that insane. this is the same person and then I knew I gotta go there, like <laughs> no, no way back anymore. <laughs> and luckily it turned out perfectly. When I first met Brie, I heard so much about her already, but not until I came to Plant the Lights, I found out that one of our very good friends, Frank Fisher, already worked at Plant the Lights too, and he actually 10 years ago stayed, stayed with Brie. Oh. You remember Frank? No, do you yeah. <laughs> I was talking to him in September. We had our 20 years anniversary of our nursery and he came because he just opened up his own business. He's doing, totally. surprise, surprise, salvias. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. He's very much in smitten by salvia. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so of course Plant the Lights was his place to be regarding to Salvia, yeah. but it was just so funny, he kept telling me about Brie, I have to meet this girl, um, now probably Lady Brie, and I was like, okay, I mean, I'll come here and I will meet her, and it took me not even two weeks, I think, until I got to know you. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, it's internationally just all connected. Yeah. It's remarkable people's pet plants. Because I don't get salvia, I don't get epimedium, but I totally get hosta. Um, and you know, I think that your backgrounds, or I, I don't know what well, it is. Well, rhodia. Rhodia was the plant that Tony decided to hire me because I got so enthralled by his rhodia collection. Well, and rhodia is a good one to collect because yes. it has, it's obscure. It has extremely minute, minute details <laughs> that will create a whole <laughs> new... I you know, love a dragon. Oh, 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 and that's what gosh. I'm most jealous about, that um, <laughs> Keith is actually working in the gardens because he gets to see them all and he doesn't have that many yet in the nursery. Yeah. So all I see you know is why like, he doesn't have many in the nursery? They because don't they grow. all get rust and I have to chop them back every yeah, single and it season. But still, yeah. you get yeah. to see him. Chopped? Chopped. <laughs> I mean, not at all. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I do think Rhodia is the great underutilized plant of Zone oh. 7. Oh, yes, for sure. Um, but the, the cultural issues, particularly from kind of not inbreeding so much as just asexual production in the nursery mm -hmm. have created some big problems. Mm -hmm. You know, the anthracnose um, epidemic has basically ruined most of the cultivars in the collector's market. Mm -hmm. So you are chopping them down every single year. And I don't know for sure, but we have found that it's one particular cultivar that is sort of the hotbed. Ooh, that, what, what variety? Oh, you would ask. It has <laughs> white edges. Suncrest? No. Miyako Nojo? Yes. Miyako Nojo. It's probably I just can that. I can see that. One. Yeah, and uh, it's tall. To our hostels. Rusty, <laughs> <anyway. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Rusty like an like, old I, car left in the yard. Well, I don't whatever. get it. Whatever. Here's another one I don't get. Galanthus. You know, this thing has no. a warm... <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, you know, I take this whole no, 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 no. We don't get the rest but Galanthus is kind of one of those odd things that... Um, from an outsider's point of view, I don't kind of get the appeal necessarily, but people adore this plant. And, uh, you know, across the world, people love this oh. tiny little ephemeral Well, it's thing. the first It's the first thing, one, right? And then you have I to... I think it means something culturally to people across the globe. No, it must see, be something else in North besides. Carolina, you have evergreen all the time. Mm -hmm. I come from Austria. I see snow for two months. And when this teeny tiny little bit of snow goes away, but there's still snow around, and I see the first green coming up, and then I can look under the skirt, we call it look under the skirt of the yes. flower, uh. and then you find this awesome varieties. Yeah, I can see it why you don't get it, but European countries, and I mean I England, that just, way. I mean, they go all crazy, like the UK, they sold last year one Galantis, it was some sort of Galantis with yellow and double and whatever, I can't even remember, but they sold it for 700 pounds. Oh, wow. One bowl. Oh, wow. One single bowl. Well, I mean... If you're a collector. But the first person who bought it, you know, he said, you know, they it, right? had it in every magazine. It was like the best advertisement ever. And speaking of marketing, 
It was super cheap because what is 700 if everybody talks about it? Right. True, but there's a trophy element to it, I think, as well. That, you know, of course, he was the first one. Right. <laughs> I well, you've get. got to applaud the collector's market for Funding. keeping that relevance. Like, mm -hmm. you can go to a hosta convention well, yeah. and people still truly get excited about the smallest intricacies. And they Absolutely. are willing to pay yeah. and support that will ultimately trickle down to 10 varieties that make it to the mass market. Of course. And, you know, that's what's so incredible about the role that Plant Blights plays because you might only have 1% of the plants that you're growing there ever make it into Mainstream. even an ordinary garden center, mm -hmm. let alone a box store. Mm -hmm. But the influence and impact that that nursery has on anybody that's intrinsically motivated by plants mm -hmm. is so meaningful. Well, and you know yes. the big box stores have approached Tony about having a line that they can carry. And Tony says, you don't understand. No. What we carry, you can't sell. It's still so important still that you have those places like Plant Delights. Mm -hmm. And I know Plant Delights is the pretty much only one in here in the U.S. But we have a lot more in Europe. We have at least 10 which are comparable to Plant Delights. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's still so important to keep those specialty nurseries alive because yeah. those are still the ones who will find this one plant out of hundred different selections Tony made, but this one one, this one plant can actually get into the mass production. I'm thinking of my dad's Sedo Manchalina. Mm -hmm. Which is we have we are specialty yes. nursery, so ninety percent of our plants are totally not worth <laughs> producing on I mean they're totally worth it, but not for mass production. Mm -hmm. But I mean see the Manchalina, it's everywhere. It and transformed the sedum market. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I feel Absolutely. like... It's Steppables, still, yeah. everything else. Yeah. It's so important to have this really good nursery people who know their business and who will find this one hit wonder, basically. And you know what's interesting, and I hadn't thought about it until now, but because of specialty nurseries, it's a two-way street. Not only do they find new plants, but people with interesting pass-alongs or interesting finds from nature or whatever bring it to a specialty nursery. Because I actually wrote my master thesis exactly on that topic, how the impact between um, specialty nurseries, wholesale nurseries, um, liners and seed nurseries, and then also marketing companies, how this all plays together throughout the whole world Oh my gosh. To get new species. I want to read your master's oh, thesis. It's in German. <laughs> it's in German. I told her I would help her it translate. translate. Yeah, <laughs> and I also, like, I focused, I went even a step further, which is a very new approach of doing it, is how the social embeddedness is involved in this whole process. So it makes it super interesting how important it is that people connect from all the world. Mm -hmm. So this lady knows actually even about Tony mm -hmm. and brings it to him. But then Tony also, if he would feel like this is something for mass production, he needs to know somebody to bring Get it to Europe. them. Yes. And then they need to know somebody to bring it to Europe. And then they need to know somebody, again, going down to a garden center in Germany or Exactly. And so. talking of, uh, again, that same subject, when Tony, Tony tells the story of an English nursery person coming to his nursery and seeing just the Spigelia marylandica, just a native to the East Coast, taking it back with him and propagating it for sale. Years later, Tony went to visit that nursery person who has a wholesale operation, and he said, oh, by the way, are you still growing the Spigelia. And the guy just sort of chuckled and motioned for Tony to follow. <laughs> they go through this warehouse or these warehouses in the nursery and all of a sudden he opens up these sliding double doors and it is absolutely filled with the U.S. <laughs> native Spigelia. And he said that they sold 150000 the year before and were projected to sell 250000 that year. So all because of the ones. Because of his visit, yeah. you know, but you have to think, you know, that's an exotic in Europe because it came from the New World. Well, I have a question for you about the European market with regard to American natives. Like, 
here I feel like we've created a, a very toxic environment when we have a natives versus ornamentals discussion. Yeah. In my opinion, it's completely misguided. Mm -hmm. It's it's we if you love plants, you need to love them all. And yes. just get get over where it's from. We are way past needing to have border patrol. But do Europeans feel this same kind of nationalism, so to speak, about about plants? Yes and no at the same time. So what I found really interesting is that if it's a native plant to somewhere else, it's super exotic and they will buy it immediately. We had a discussion actually about Astas. Uh -huh. We sell at our nursery 150 different varieties, just of Astas, and I saw only two maybe at Tony's place. I was like, why are you only selling two? And they're like, well, they're native here. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's weird, because we love them, and I know they are native here. If it goes to Austrian natives, it's a hit or miss. If it's anything rare from the Alps, for example, Gensiana, um, the blue, mm -hmm. the common name, uh, those common names. Uh, what is that common name? Gentian. Gentian, yeah, Gentian. Uh, it's so close to the genus name, I just call it Gentiana. Yeah. Gentian. Gentian. Sounds yeah. good. I'm I'm gonna stick with my Latin names. <laughs> yes. Don't so. get bogged down by that nonsense. <laughs> so those are still like people want to have them because they maybe don't live in the Alps where I grew up. Believe it or not, there is areas in Austria where there's not a mountain. That's where I live. <laughs> people love it because they want to feel like in the mountains. Um, other than that, they are pretty much, if I think about hellebores, they would like walk by and would say, ah, oh, got this in the woods, don't need that. But then this is like the mainstream customers you get. Yeah. But now we have this very new line where people get really excited about natives and using them for um, like cooking and stuff. Oh. So this, we, I know already about two or three nurseries actually in Germany and Austria who totally specialized in only native plants. They like grow native plants in a pot and sell it to people. Where I think, I mean, knowing plants, I would just walk out on the field and look for the plant if I want to have it and wouldn't pay five dollars. So what about all of, you, you mentioned hellebores, what about all of the new Doubles, doubles and the new colors and the fact that they're breeding for the upright uh, or at least forward-facing Yes, um, you, I mean there is just the difference if you talk about a customer Gardening in, in Austria is really big. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a garden But then you distinguish between the people who just have a garden how they always used to garden, how their moms taught them to garden. It's mostly annuals, it's... I mean, Window boxes. Yeah, let's be honest, between us, nothing where we get very excited. Okay. And those are the people, they're like, no, I mean, it's a hellebores. I don't care if that is black, blue, double, has some sprinkles in it or not. Well, upright. I would admit there are echinacea, that's echinacea to me. I yeah. take it or leave it, I don't I'm care, you make it... You can make uh, it triple, and you can make it four colors, and but, I still don't care. please hair. don't. Yeah, but just stop. Just give me, like, the old-fashioned pink <laughs> one. Exactly. You know, that actually yeah. lives or seeds that. well enough to mm -hmm. be able to make a colony. But I feel that way about American natives. I'm not turned on by them. Yeah. Well, but I wonder what that is, because I think that, you know, it's, it's really about um, uh, exoticism. And, you know, once you take echinacea out of the, uh, the vitriol of the native versus exotic debate, I think oh, it's, it's so hard to kind of evaluate that plant um, based upon its, its garden merit. I mean, I, if, you know, if you were an alien coming down to Earth and looking at echinacea, it's, it's incredibly durable. Mm -hmm. um, the species and kind of the early cultivars like, you know, Magnus and Kim's and Hyde yeah, yeah. have very few disease problems. Uh, it flowers for easily three months in my garden. It's immediately recognizable. Uh, the pollinate or the insects love it. You know, I think... I and it does have an it. herbal component, which... I think yeah. in the plant nerd world, we dismiss oh, the edible or herbal component that 
in, in a lot of ways, would be engaging her, you know, a new or broader demographic. Yeah. And that's how those specialty nurseries who only spe- specialize in this, how that's how they survive. Right. Because yeah. there is this people who are interested, but the rest isn't. There are clouds of pseudoscience floating around herbal qualities and uh, plants. Horticulturists <laughs> are already <laughs> marginal individuals anyways, and they do not need the <laughs> added <laughs> the added complication of uh, aligning themselves no, with, with pseudoscience. I'm not that saying herbal medicine is all pseudoscience. I have I'm, you know sacrifice all of my free time to a project about ethnobotany. Yeah. So I adore the stories that, that, that the herbal element of plants give. But I think that the, you know, the big debate, and I don't want to go in that rabbit hole of native versus non-native, but there's a certain degree to which um, I love the fact that uh, Pete Uldolf and so many Europeans love American natives. And, um, well, and that's because they, they like the prairie aesthetic. And what is more native to America than fundamentally the prairie? Mm. Which is not native to this part of America, no. by the way. Right. So when people get on the natives bandwagon and they want to emulate Illinois in central North Carolina, they have to pull I think sweet they've gum. completely missed the whole mm-hmm. point yeah. of the natives movement. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, you, you would be in a pine-based forest. Mm-hmm. You would be growing broadleaf evergreen shrubs. Right. You would not be growing different varieties of ornamental grasses. Well, at point, what point do you stop and just, you know, um, plant American chestnut everywhere? I mean, it's, you know, it's... it's Precisely. It's, 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 <laughs> I, I think it's a silly argument. I think that the, the native versus exotic thing is... It, the reason that it rages on and continues to be rather unresolved is because everybody is not talking about the bigger issue, and that is how willing are we to be a global people? Mm-hmm. One of the most... Um, I, a year ago today, I moved into my apartment... And, um, and and garden in a funny way. I, I, I segregated a native perennial garden, a vegetable garden, and an annual garden. I usually merge all these three things, but I accidentally kind of segregated this time. And I posted a comment about my native perennial garden. And I shouldn't have said, I believe in my heart this to be true. Because I didn't mean it. I mean, I mean, it's amazing, by the way, people, people come out of the woodwork. Be right? careful with that, Hermes. <laughs> oh, yeah. The second you become a fundamentalist, people jump on you. And I wasn't a fundamentalist, but I did notice that only three of those three gardens, the, the native perennial garden, the vegetable garden, and the annual garden, only one of them had any appeal to insects. And it was, it was obvious. It wasn't like even like a, it was black and white. Um, but when I posted that post about believing that there was an enormous amount of value that native perennial gardens brought to the landscape relative to ecology and ecological service, I had the most likes and response to that post. And what I thought was remarkable is I had the most amount of responses from non-horticulturists. And I think the native versus exotic debate is not about plants. I think we don't even care. I think it's really about place and how willing are we to be part of a globe or how much do we need to be from that little town we're from. Mm-hmm. And I think that there, I think people are, I think the concept of being global is too big for people. It's frightening. We're headed that way, but it's too frightening. And there's some sort of comfort in being from Charlottesville, from being wherever you're from. And there's a certain degree to which native plants represent a value of place. And I think that's why Echinacea and certain natives here get an unjustifiable bad rap. And that I, I, I'm, I'm eager to kind of shed the native versus exotic, you know, kind of like tags to anything. This is mm-hmm. a plant that is rapidly changing. I don't think and it's changing humans fast. humans are a enough. part of the evolution of all things. Yeah, absolutely. And what I think bothers me the most with the natives movement is how these tend to be very progressive, well-educated people that at some stage want to cut humanity out. Ah, uh, but they're expressing their frustration about... Capitalism, corporatization, globalization, it has nothing to do with plants. But at the end of the day, nobody's eating native. I, I totally no, lost true. you. What is the problem here in the U.S.? Well, I think that... <laughs> so, uh, is this people who don't like cultivars because they're they don't like cultivars, They don't like ornamental horticulture, or they put a very low value on ornamental horticulture. Well, and what I've seen as a Woody's producer is that there are 
culturally native plants that are extremely important, specifically to the southeastern landscape. You go to a garden and you don't see a gardenia or a hydrangea or a holly or a camellia and you don't feel like you're in the south. None of those plants are historically native, right. but they've been here for several hundred years. They've proven themselves very capable and they are instrumental in our ecosystems. And they, they all don't provide nectar. Non natives, except at all. if we put them there. Well, yeah. precisely. You know, and, and so it's like, I don't want to be in the southeast without nice broadleaf evergreens. This is the climate. Where would we for be them. without great myrtles? And frankly, what's they native it, that all these continents touched at one point, let's just face the facts. Look at the fossil record. Yeah, I mean, just because glaciers came and moved things around doesn't mean that it's impossible that Metasequoia or Ginkgo actually were on this continent long before humans evolved. Uh, well, that's where we be very careful because this kind of like very liberal <laughs> yeah. approach uh, to gardening where it's like, well, forget it. It's like, whatever you want to plant, plant. Well, okay, but um, for the most part, I think that we still, for the rest of our lives, will be situated in a situation where we have this population of ruby throated hummingbirds, we have this population of insects, da 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 and that, that, you know, we can't be too casual necessarily about what we plant. But I think if, personally, I think if you're really trying to make a difference about um, ecological service, all of our backyards, I don't necessarily think that we are as developed as the Northeast. And I think that's where uh, Doug Tallamy and Richard Dark's work takes a little bit of departure from here in the Southeast. We are not that urbanized yet. Right. We still have the luxury to plant what we want to plant because we still have so much intact wilderness or at least kind of like corridors for wildlife. Now, that might change specifically here in Raleigh as we kind of like, Get bigger, hopefully bigger, not bigger. that inevitable march towards Alexandria, Virginia. I mean, hopefully this is not, you know, kind of a yeah. corridor stretching. Um, but I think that if you're really passionate about native plants and, and really recovering a certain degree of ecological service, you need to go into city planning and fight development, mm -hmm. not tackle it in your backyard garden. In fact, well, I think these novel landscapes with the Baptisia and Echinacea, I don't think you're really doing anything anyways in this is pretty really, you know, really salacious in my community. And and you can't plans, fight, fight development though, but you can be a part of how it unfolds. Making development more functional. Absolutely. Um, I well, was... and frankly, if people want to make a real difference, grow 25% of what you consume. Change True, yeah. commercial agriculture. Change True. the chemistry that is involved oh, in food yes. production. Mm -hmm. And then we can recreate nature in the Midwest where it's most lacking because we have 100,000 consecutive acres of corn, which is used exclusively for making corn syrup for cola to give people type 2 diabetes. Oh my god. You know, I mean, it's a really disturbing trend what commercial agriculture has done. So the native food movement or the native plants movement if they were to take some responsibility for their own consumption of plants, not in the ornamental value, but in the way that they eat mm. three times a day, 365 days of the year, we could actually make a far bigger difference. Mm. We change the way our food is grown. But well, you know, I don't planting think... an echinacea to me... Uh, <laughs> It's a gesture, and I think for people in the <laughs> native who, who who kind of like label themselves as native plant enthusiasts, um, it's a it's a small feel good moot gesture. I think ultimately to say, you know what, daggum it, I'm making one small move against overdevelopment, against um, the degradation of the environment. And I think that's what it is. Now the native plant movement, and I don't mean to be a representative of this movement, but um, and the 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 edible landscaping movement, I don't necessarily think overlap necessarily. Though they should. Uh, yes. Well, yeah. Why they not? completely should. There is no reason that they shouldn't be. Mm. Because frankly, people that are into growing their own food also have ecology and environment at heart. You know, my goal is to make it so that we don't leave such an enormous carbon footprint. I want zero kilometer as much as I possibly can consume. And I think as someone's in the Midwest, because I don't have that relationship with those sprawling farms. I have absolutely no concept of what some of these corn farms in the Midwest, even, I've only seen them from airplanes. And for me, they're little circles the size of dimes. <laughs> My issue, and I think we have the same issue, is overdevelopment. You know, I, when, I, when, I, uh, when I go to the average backyard, Encouraging those homeowners to plant edibles is not my angle because I think that 
as a tired nine to fiver, I don't know how most nine to fivers go outside and really maintain a garden especially not an annual garden that composed of edibles. I find that most of my clientele as a landscape designer really wants some relief from the labor of the garden, in which case I have completely abandoned specking perennials, except for the occasional echinacea, magnus, and panicum, and some very basic stuff that I know will perform reliably and choke out weeds a little bit. Um, for me, my angle is to reforest to as best as I can, some native, some not, focusing on diversity, but for wildlife. Because, I mean, I encounter folks who have way, way more acreage than they, than they want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so a lot of part of my job as a landscape designer is about reforestation. I don't know what it is about, you know, that same challenge is, you know, is for you guys in different parts of the state. I, so I think we represent very, very totally different systems. Yeah. So yeah. I actually just made, like, listening to you guys, that made me realize, do you think that all has to do be with the fact that your history of ornamental horticulture is so much younger than ours? Because I've really seriously never heard anybody complain about anything you talk about right now. Yeah, we totally can't take a break.